Thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to have Manuel Rivera from Purdue. Um, he was actually a student here, so he's, he's back now. Um, his talk is Bialgebras and Loop Spaces. Thank you, Manuel. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So thank you for the invitation to speak, and thanks to the organizer for what it looks to be an exciting conference. I was told I was the guinea pig. Pointed at the computer. <laughs> oh. Nope. Computer on your right. <laughs> no, don't touch that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. It doesn't work. Yeah, but that's. Uh, Can you use the arrow keys? Yes, thank you, speaker. Like, oh, there you go. So, um, so we're celebrating four decades of the Einstein Chair Center, and I'm uh, less than four decades old. <laughs> but um, I've been participating for the last 10 years, I guess. And um, I would like to start with some guiding questions that have been and continue to be explored in this seminar. And we have all heard Dennis emphasize, emphasizing some of these questions. Um, so the first one is what is the algebraic nature of space, or what is space algebraically? Um, that's sort of a philosophical question. What's the relationship between the, the uh, algebraic structures of numbers and the concept of space? And maybe more precise mathematical questions are what is a homotopy type in terms of algebraic chain level structure? And in the presence of geometric structure, what is the algebraic chain level meaning of a space being a manifold? So in this talk, I will discuss some math related to these questions by analyzing algebraic structures arising through spaces of loops in a geometric space. So it turns out that the structure of loop spaces will reveal uh, a lot of the, the structure of the underlying space. So this talk will feature different types of bialgebras. So let's fix a commutative ring K. And by a K bialgebra, I mean a K module B equipped with a product map, which I will call mu, and a co-product map that satisfy certain conditions and compatibilities. Okay? And these, will, these conditions and compatibilities will come in different flavors. And today we will discuss four types of bialgebras whose um, we will associate to these four names of uh, mathematicians. Hoff, Frobenius, Leibniz, and Lee. So let me discuss these. Um, depending on the compatibilities, we will give them a special name. So in the first three examples, or the first three types of bialgebras, I will assume the product is a unital associative product, and the coproduct is a co-unital co-associative coproduct. And we say B is a Hoff bialgebra if the coproduct is a map of unital algebras. So here I consider B tensor B, so the tensor product will always be over the underlying ring K. So I'm consider B tensor B as an algebra with the tensor product of products. Okay? So that's how we should interpret this thought. So the word unital is just to rule out the zero map? Um, the word unital, yes, means that it implies that, but it means that the unit is preserved. But it has to be. If there is a unit and it's a non zero map, does it have to be preserved? Um, I think you can. Oh, uh, yes, unitality is a property. So yes, it's, it's preserved. So, so the word unital could be dropped except for right. zero man. Right, exactly. So we will call an bialgebra a Frobenius bialgebra if the coproduct is a map of B by modules. So now I'm interpreting B as a bimodule over itself with respect to the product map, and B tensor B as a bimodule by acting on the left, 
on the first copy of, on the left copy of B using the product, and on the right, on the second copy of B using the product as well. So a bimodule B, you have an action on the left and an action on the right, and that's all? And, uh, and, uh, and these are compatible, right? No, no, there's a need to be a bimodule. So, uh, I mean, a bimodule means essentially it's a module over B tensor B, but the second copy of B, you flip the multiplication. So you have an action of B tensor. That's the best way to say it. I learned from Berlin that the source of law means that an algebra is a bimodule over itself. It's a times x times so there's y a couple, yeah. equals a times x y. Means <clears throat> the left and the right multiplication commute. That's what it means to be a bimodule. Right. That's what I wanted you to emphasize. So right. Express it in that other way. <clears throat> about B tensor BI, but that's sort of professional, right? Nobody can remember that. It's <laughs> <laughs> the associative law. Right, right. There's a, there's a condition that has to be satisfied, which is associativity. So we can require this co-product map to be a map of bimodules. Yeah. And we will call it a Frobenius bi-algebra. And this is the equation. It's an equality of three terms. And now, I will call a Leibniz bialgebra a bialgebra in which the co-product satisfies the Leibniz rule. So if the co-product is a derivation of the product. So <coughs> the compatibility equation um, can be written as follows, where this dot is interpreted as the write bimodule action on B tensor B, and this dot here is interpreted as the left bimodule action on B tensor B. So note I'm replacing this equality sign by a plus sign here. <coughs> These are also non, known as infinitesimal bialgebras in the literature, but for symmetry, I wanted to attach the name. Because Leibniz is the one who proved the product rule for differentiation. Right, exactly. And uh, a Lie bialgebra is a Lie version of a Leibniz bialgebra. So the, pro the product and the coproduct are now satisfied to be, are now required to be a Lie bracket and a Lie co-bracket. And then the derivation equation is interpreted using the adjoint action of the Lie algebra on itself. So these are the four types, four flavors of bialgebras that will be featured in this talk. So this will be a survey-like talk. Um, the plan is a bit ambitious. Let's see how far we get. Um, but I'm happy to discuss more details uh, during the break. So an example of a Hopf bialgebra is uh, the group ring bialgebra. So let B, let G be any group, and let K of G be the free K module generated by the group G, so linear combinations with coefficients in K. So um, the product of the group induces a product on linear combinations. <coughs> and the diagonal map on the generators induces a coproduct on linear combinations. And uh, these turn out to satisfy the, um, the axioms of a Hopf bialgebra, and in particular, it's co commutative. So the co product is symmetric. If I flip the two factors after applying the co product, I get the same expression. This bialgebra has a property, a special property, it has an antipode map. It's a, um, a self-map uh, satisfying certain conditions, and in this case, is given by sending an element to its inverse. So uh, maybe I should recall quickly a definition of an antipode. So if B is a Hopf bialgebra, then an antipode map 
is a linear map from V to itself that is an inverse for the identity map with respect to this product on endomorphisms on B. It's called the convolution product. You first apply the co-product, then apply F tensor G, and then apply the product map. So inverses are unique. So the existence of antipode is a property on the hop bias. This, bio, this Hopf bialgebra structure completely determines the underlying group. In other words, I can apply the group-like elements functor um, to this bialgebra, and I get a group. We haven't said what that is. Uh, yeah. I, I, I get a group, which is I, naturally isomorphic to uh, the group we, we started with. with. So what's the group-like elements functor? So an element in an abstract Hopf bialgebra is called group-like if it satisfies this equation, essentially. Right? And the construction that associates to any Hopf bialgebra, it's um, monoid of group-like elements is functorial. And if the Hopf bialgebra has an antipode, this monoid of group-like ele elements has the property of being a group. So this algebraic structure on this linearization of the group completely determines the group structure. Okay. So any group is a fundamental group of a space. Right? So that's the perspective I want to take now. Let x be the appointed space, and let's consider the group by algebra of the fundamental group. Maybe let's call it the fundamental group by algebra. This is exactly the zero homology of the space of base loops, of loops based at B in X with K coefficients. Let's recall what the base loop space is. So the base loop space is the space, or the model for the base loop space that we will consider in, is the space of all continuous maps from an interval from 0 to t, where t is a non-negative real number, that start and end at the base point b. This has a natural topology known as the compact open topology. And the base loop space becomes a topological monoid with loop concatenation. In fact, it's associative in this model. The loop concatenation is an associative product um, since there's no reparametrization involved when defining the concatenation of two loops. And now applying the singular chains to this space level associative product, we get a differential graded algebra. In fact, a differential graded Hopf by algebra. So the product map, the loop concatenation map, induces a product on the singular chains by first applying this um, natural transformation known as the eilenberg zilberg map, which relates the tensor product of chains to the chains in the product of spaces, and then applying the induced map at the level of chains from this concatenation product. The chains on any space is also equipped with a co-product map. This co-product map is obtained by first applying the map induced at the level of chains, the map at the level of chains induced by the diagonal map, and then applying this Alexander-Whitney natural transformation, which relates the chains on a product of spaces to the tensor product of chains. Okay. This co-product dualizes to the classical cup product on co-chains. Okay. And the singular chains also have a degree minus one map, known as the boundary map, which squares to zero. And all of these 
maps are compatible. Um, in other words, this differential map is a derivation of the product, satisfies the Leibniz rule. This derivation map is a co-derivation of the co-product. It satisfies a property dual to the Leibniz rule. Um, these are associative and co-associative. And um, can you say the Leibniz rule again? What did you say about the Leibniz rule? That I, I said that these maps are compatible in the sense oh, that oh, okay. yeah. So it's a hub by algebra in the setting, in the presence of a differential graded structure. It's compatible with this chain complex structure. No antipode. No antipode, but the zeroth homology is a bialgebra that has an antipode. Oh. Because every loop has an inverse up to homotopy, but not a strict inverse. Let me quickly review this construction of um, singular chains. So to any arbitrary topological space, we can consider the K module of N chains. This is the free K module generated by continuous maps from the topological N simplex to the space Y. For any such a generator, we have this um, boundary map, which is the alternating sum of the faces, and this is an explicit formula for the Alexander Whitney co product map. Um, so, how do I interpret this notation? I restrict sigma, let's, let's see it down here, I restrict sigma to the first i dimensional face of the n simplex, and here I restrict sigma to the last n minus i dimensional face of the n simplex. So this is an element of degree n in the graded tensor product of graded modules. And these are compatible, as I just said. Um, this forms a differential graded co-associative co-algebra. And the topological monoid structure on y induces a differential graded Hopf by algebra structure in the chains, which is what we saw in the previous slide. And um, any point B in Y gives rise to a connected version of this differential graded coalgebra. So here I will be considering all continuous maps from a simplex to Y, which send the vertices of the simplex to the base point B. By the word connected, I mean that at degree zero, I have a one dimensional K module. So it has a single generator. Okay, so um, let's summarize some of the constructions that we've seen in this functorial language. So associated to any pointed space, so this denotes the category of pointed spaces. Let's say pointed connected spaces. We obtain a topological monoid through the base loops construction. But associated to any pointed space, we can also as naturally associate a differential graded coalgebra structure. This star means that I'll consider this pointed version of coalgebra. And I can, I can also apply the chains construction on this side, and I get a differential graded bialgebra structure. But let's first consider the underlying differential graded algebra structure. Okay. So a question, a natural question, is if it's possible to model the passage from a pointed space to a topological monoid in purely algebraic terms. In other words, if I can fill in um, this, this, if I can construct a functor from coalgebras to algebras that makes this diagram commute up to natural quasi-isomorphism. A quasi-isomorphism is a map of underlying chain complexes that induces an isomorphism in homology. And the, the answer is given by this so-called Kobar construction, which was introduced by Adams in 56. 
and it goes as follows. So given a differential graded coalgebra that consists of the data of a K graded K module C, a differential D, and a coproduct delta, I will construct a differential graded algebra as follows. I will consider the free algebra, free graded algebra, on this C bar. So C bar is the following. I take the underlying graded module C. I mod out by the degree zero submodule, which is just a copy of the underlying ring in this case. So I only consider positive, positively graded um, elements. And then I shift everything down by one. If something was in degree two, it now becomes of degree one. And if something was in degree one, now becomes of degree zero, right? And there's no negative. There's no negative because this was, um, I killed all of the degree zero part. And now I consider the free algebra generated by that, by that C bar, okay? So these are monomials on C, the free associative algebra. And then I define a differential by extending this linear map, the sum of the underlying differential and the coproduct, as a derivation using the free property of this algebra. You extend it as a derivation to all monomials. Long initiative. I mean, the secret is the shift that makes the delta. Let me explain that because that took me years to learn that, and then affected my life. Right, and, and yeah. with this, with this grading, with this shift, uh, this map becomes a degree minus one map. The delta doesn't change its degree. Exactly. Right. Delta is of degree zero originally. Yeah. When you shift, it becomes a degree minus one map. I mean, the little del doesn't change, and well, the other one changes. Right, exactly. The, I lost my laser pointer. The little bell is of degree minus one, so it doesn't change after you shift. Because it's one to one operation. Right. So the coproduct does change because of the one to two operator, so it changes down by one. Yeah. And then d squared d squared equals zero is equivalent to the coproduct being co-associative, this little d squaring to zero, and the coproduct and little d being compatible. The, yeah. So that's the Cobar construction, produces a, a differential graded algebra from a differential graded co-algebra. And now, I will use this construction to define a notion of equivalence on coalgebras simply by pulling back quasi-isomorphisms of algebras through this functor. Namely, I will call a map of coalgebras to be a Cobar quasi-isomorphism if it induces a quasi-isomorphism of algebras after applying the Cobar functor. And this has meaning because the Cobar functor does not preserve quasi-isomorphisms in general. Yep? You had one more construction, which was the group algebra on the fundamental group. Mm -hmm. What is that? I will come back to it soon. Right now, I'm considering the chains on a topological monoid as a differential graded algebra. So I'm forgetting about the bi-algebra structure for the moment, but we will come back to it. And um, the theorem that uh, I proved with Mahmoud, building upon the work of Adams and also Baus, is the following. It essentially says that this algebraic construction models the passage from a point of topological space to a to a topological monoid. More precisely, for any point in topological space, there is a natural quasi-isomorphism of differential graded algebras from the Cobar construction on the chains to the chains on the base loop space, now considered as a differential graded algebra. And furthermore, 
And that's without Adam's hypothesis of simply connection. Yeah, I, I will come back to this in a second. Furthermore, there's a natural co-product on the pole-bar construction on the chains of any arbitrary space, making this differential graded algebra into a differential graded half by algebra. And such that theta preserves this structure. So this first statement was proven by Adams in the simply connected case. And 60 years later, uh, Mahmoud and I realized that this simply connected hypothesis can be removed from the same statement. But the subtlety is, again, that this Kolbar construction does not preserve quasi-isomorphisms. <coughs> so it is not true that if I replace this, these singular chains by something quasi-isomorphic to it, I also get a model for the Kolbar construction. There's some kind of geometry involved. There's some kind of geometry involved, which is uh, precisely related to this um, issue with having inverses. Sorry, what's a quasi isomorphism of DG algebras? It's a map of differential graded algebras such that the map of underlying chain complexes is a quasi isomorphism. And what's a quasi isomorphism? It's a map inducing an isomorphism after passing to homology. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so, in, in particular, in particular, this statement explains, explains the sense in which the algebraic structure of the chains completely determines the fundamental group of the underlying space. Because I can start with this coalgebra of chains, apply the Kobar construction, and now I have a differential graded Hoff by algebra. I can take the zero homology of it, that's a half by algebra. And I can apply the group like elements functor to it. And I get a monoid that has the property of being a group. And that's isomorphic to the fundamental group. Done. <laughs> so um, you can ask. Yeah. You can ask um, how much do the chains in the space know about the underlying space, right? We know that it knows the fundamental group. How about the homotopy type of the, of the space? So the first result in that direction <coughs> is the following, which says that the singular chains suitably interpreted completely detect weak homotopy equivalences. So a weak homotopy equivalence is a map inducing an isomorphism on homotopy groups, right? So more precisely, the statement is the following. A pointed, ma a continuous map of pointed spaces is a weak homotopy equivalence if and only if the map induced at the level of singular chains is a Kolbar quasi-isomorphism, or if it becomes a quasi-isomorphism after applying the Kolbar functor. So that's uh, a result in, in, in that direction. But turns out we can say more. So I will revisit this diagram again. So we have the base loop space functor takes a pointed space, produces a topological monoid. And now the chains functor, I've added this B here, which means that I'm considering the chains with additional structure. Namely, in the previous statement, I said that we are able to co construct a co-product on the Kolbar construction, making it a DG Hoff by algebra. So, that's what I mean by this B here. I mean co-algebras equipped with this additional piece of structure on its Kolbar construction. 
So the Kovar construction now produces a differential graded by algebra. So, um, and we show that this diagram commutes up to natural quasi-isomorphism. And for, a, for technical matters, I will factor this construction of singular chains through the following two functors. Associated to any topological space, I can consider its simplicial co-commutative co-algebra of chains. Okay? And then to any simplicial co-commutative co-algebra, which I will describe uh, in, in one second, I can obtain a differential graded co-algebra with this additional structure through a construction know known as the normalized chains. So a, what's a simplicial co-commutative co-algebra? It's a sequence of co-algebras. I will consider connected ones, namely at degree zero, they're one dimensional. It's a sequence of co-algebras connected by linear maps, by maps of co-algebras, um, which satisfy these um, simplicial identities. So you have face maps going down and degeneracy maps going up. So the singular chains on a, on a space can be understood in terms of this data by considering the simplicial structure of, of the syntheses themselves. Right? So you decompose the singular chains in terms of these data. And each of these are co-algebras. Right? So in the singular chains case, for example, the, the, each CN is a module of, of um, N chains. The co-product is just the diagonal map. So it's completely symmetric. But this symmetry is broken once I pass through the differential graded world. But I still have um, a homotopical symmetry that can be encoded in terms of additional structure. In any case, we define a localized version of the Kobar functor at this level of simplicial co-algebras. So this localized version fixes the issue that the zero homology of the Kobar construction of an arbitrary co-algebra might not have an antipode. Right? So you formally add certain inverses in this construction to force this. And now the statement, or a statement we can prove, is the following. So assume K is now an algebraically closed field. In particular, I have in mind the algebraic closure of the field with P elements. Then the simplicial chains functor, which is this functor up here, this diagonal functor, induces a full and faithful embedding of homotopy theories from topological spaces considered up to the following notion of equivalence, which I will explain in a second, to co-algebras considered up to this notion of equivalence created by this localized version of Kovar quasi-isomorphisms. So what do I mean by pi-1 equivalence, pi-1k equivalence? So a map of, topo of pointed topological spaces is defined to be a pi-1 equivalence if it induces an isomorphism on fundamental groups and if it induces an isomorphism on the k-homology of the universal covers. This notion makes sense for any commutative ring K. In particular, if K is the ring of integers, this is equivalent by a theorem of Whitehead to weak homotopy equivalence of spaces. 
But in homotopy theory, it's often useful to analyze spaces one prime at a time. And this is what we're doing here. We're describing the homotopy theory, or a particular homotopy theory of spaces, one prime at a time, in terms of algebra or co-algebraic structure. In other words, this means that any topological space up to this notion of equivalence can be completely recovered from the weak equivalence type of its co-algebra of chains, considered as a simplicial co-commutative co-algebra. It's co-bar equivalence. Co-bar equivalence, yeah. And homotopy theory just means you have some notion of weak equivalence or something? Essentially, but um, we construct model category structures on each side uh -huh. and prove that the, we have a full in a junction such that this chain functor is homotopically full and faithful. Mm -hmm. Do you need algebraically closed uh, for this theorem or is it just the artifact of the proof? We need it uh, for this theorem. So it, it doesn't hold true for all fields? No. Yeah. I can say more about this later. In fact, the way we use the hypothesis of algebraically closed, or the way it enters the proof, is in the fact that over an algebraically closed field, there's only one simple co-commutative co-algebra, namely K itself considered as a co-algebra. And that's, if you look at the proof of this statement, it's a version of the Null-Stellenstatz, a dual version in some sense. So. so that's it for the first part of the talk. It's related to the first question I posed at the beginning of what is the, um, um, what, what are homotopy types algebraically? The second part of the talk is related to string topology. So, let's see. Can you mention I'm Mandel's, how Mandel's work fits in this? Because this work is based on that? Yes. So, there's uh, two pieces of work um, that are related uh, to this theorem. First, it's, there's um, a theorem of Gors which is closer in spirit to this framework, and the theorem of Mandel, right? So, Gores and Mandel uh, prove a version of this theorem, but by replacing this notion of equivalence with homology equivalence, or considering a map to be an equivalence, if it induces a, a, an isomorphism in homology with k coefficients, and replacing this notion of cobar quasi isomorphism by the weaker notion of quasi isomorphism. But also with the restriction of symplicity. In the way I said it, it does not require to say simply connected, because I'm considering spaces up to k localization. So, I started a bit late. Yeah. So, in this period of the Einstein chair seminar, maybe I can take <laughs> three or four <laughs> hours. hours. <laughs> I think so. Um, you can take ten, more, ten extra minutes. Ten extra minutes. Uh, this is going to be a challenge. But, uh, let's see, I might skip some slides, uh, which are not strictly necessary to get to the end of. Let's see. So, good. So, now, let's forget about base points. Okay? Um, so, in general, if I consider, we were first considering uh, the fundamental group, which has a fixed base point, and you can concatenate homotopy classes of loops at that fixed base point. But suppose I want to consider free homotopy classes of loops 
with no conditions and base points. A priori, there's no way of concatenating to free classes of loops. But in the presence of geometric structure, I can intersect and I can concatenate at the intersection points. So, as an example, let me start with sigma being an oriented surface, a two-dimensional manifold, and pi of sigma, the set of free homotopy classes of oriented loops in sigma. So this is the same as the path components of the space of free loops in sigma, or the space of maps from the circle to sigma, which may be identified with the conjugacy classes of the fundamental group. So in 86, Goldman described a bracket operation on the set of linear combinations of free homotopy classes of loops. And in 91, Turayev described a co-product operation, but in order to that consider self-intersections in a single class, but in order for that to be well-defined, you have to mod out by the class um, of the constant loop. Okay. So Moira will, will probably tell us more about this story in her talk. And the theorem is that for any surface sigma, these operations are compatible in one of the flavors of the bialgebras that I mentioned at the beginning. Namely, they form, they define a Lie bialgebra structure. So here's a picture um, so of the two operations. So if Let's say alpha and beta are representatives for homotopy classes of loops. So you choose representatives so that they intersect transversally, so that the intersections are generic. And then for every intersection point, you concatenate the two loops. You first do alpha and then do beta. And then you take the sum over all intersection points of these concatenated loops. And you put a sign obtained by comparing with the orientation of the underlying surface. The co-product looks at self-intersections. Um, so if you have a, a loop a, ho a, homotop a free homotopy class of a loop alpha, you represent it in a way in which all intersections are trans all self intersections are trans transversal, and at every self intersection point, you have two loops, right? Here, one on the right side, which maybe I'll call a alpha q1, and one on the left side, which I will call alpha q2, and you symmetrize so that this choice of left and right doesn't matter, and you take the sum over all intersection points. And that's a co-product operation which satisfies the anti-symmetry and the co-Jacobi identity, and this is a bracket operation which satisfies the Jacobi identity and the anti-symmetry. And they are compatible in this Levi algebra sense. So this construction was generalized uh, by Dennis and Moira for manifolds of arbitrary dimension. So let M be an oriented and manifold, and let LM be this free loop space on M, so the space of maps from the circle to M without any restrictions on base points. So here are two major string topology operations which are only the tip of the iceberg of this theory. So, Chas and Sullivan discovered a loop product on the homology on the free loop space of a manifold, 
which combines intersection and the underlying manifold and concatenation of loops at the locus of intersection. And they also describe a loop coproduct, this time of degree 1 minus n, defined on the homology of the free loop space modulo constant loops. So this construction consider all, self, all possible self-intersections on a family of loops and splits at these self-intersection points. So, and there's also a S1 equivariant version of this operation that generalize the previous structures defined on the surface. But I will consider today um, these two operations on the ordinary homology. And this is only the tip of the iceberg, right? There's a very rich algebraic structure behind these operations in some sense. This is part of what's called the BB algebra structure. This is part of what's called the co-BB algebra structure. And you can study these operations at the chain level. <coughs> well, the compatibilities are satisfied now only up to homotopy. And in the last 20 years, there has been significant research or in trying to understand the structure and significance of string topology in geometry and mathematical physics. And the perspective I have taken that connects with the previous line of work is the following. So if I want to study alge the algebraic structure of the chains on the free loop space, of any space, actually, I can think of the free loop space as fibering, as a vibration over the underlying space, with fibers being all homotopy equivalent to the base loop space. So each fiber is the base loop space at, uh, at a point B over which I'm looking at that fiber, right? And there are algebraic constructions that model the total space of a vibration in terms of an algebraic model for the base and an algebraic model for the fiber. Namely, this is the construction I have in mind is due to Brown, Ed Brown, which described a general way of defining a differential on the tensor product of the chains on the base and the chains on the fiber, which makes which produces a chain complex quasi-isomorphic to the chains on the total space. And now using the previous line of, or, or the previous result, I can replace the chains on the fiber, which in this case is the chains on the base loop space, by this Cobar model of the, of the base loop space. And I unravel the resulting differential in this case, and I obtain a construction which, which is might be go by the name might go by the name of the co hochschild complex of a coalgebra, which is dual to the Hochschild complex of an algebra, which um, is a construction uh, that was used in homological algebra and derived categories. A priori unrelated to this, this loop space uh, story. Okay. So, so let me say something why I care about this model. So in string topology, we're interested in analyzing how the, algebra, how the geometric structure of the underlying space manifests itself at the level of the free loop space. And a model for the free loop space like this one makes it more transparent, uh, makes more transparent the way in which the algebraic structure of the chains on the underlying space manifests itself at the level of a model for the free loop space. 
this Kohlhoff shield construction is a purely algebraic construction that I can apply to this chain sum the space, considered as a co-algebra under the correct notion of weak equivalence, and I obtain a model for the free loop space. So I want to equip these chains with some intersection structure and then understand how that intersection structure manifests at the level of this algebraic construction. That's the philosophy I have for it understanding the general structure of string topology. So, here's another flavor of the bi-algebra structures um, that we encounter, and it's that of uh, a Frobenius bi-algebra. So, Poincaré duality for a closed manifold implies the following, that we have an intersection, structure, an intersection product of degree minus n on the homology of the manifold. So essentially this product is given by taking two homology classes, representing them by um, cycles that intersect transversely, and describing the product to be the locus of intersection. And any space has an Alexander Whitney coproduct, as we discussed. And Poincare duality implies that these are compatible in this Frobenius sense. So the coproduct is a map of bimodules <laughs> with respect to the intersection product. So in order to um, now we want to analyze what this means for string topology using this algebraic construction of Hochschild chains. And um, to achieve that, we use this result of Lambrich and Stanley, which says that in the case of a, a field of characteristic zero, this Frobenius structure, this Poincaré duality Frobenius structure, can be lifted to the chain level in a way that the compatibilities hold strict. In other words, oh, and this is special to the case when M is a simply connected manifold. And it uses the methods of rational homotopy theory. In other words, for any simply connected closed manifold M, there is a commutative differential graded Frobenius bialgebra A or AM that satisfies the following. A is connected and it's simply connected. It's trivial at degree one. Moreover, A is quasi-isomorphic to the co-chains on M with coefficients in this algebraically closed field as a differential graded algebra. And furthermore, A, so A is a differential graded Frobenius bialgebra. Its cohomology then becomes a graded Frobenius bialgebra. And that's isomorphic to the cohomology of M considered as a Frobenius bialgebra. So we interpret this theorem as constructing a lift of this Poincaré duality structure to the level of co-chains. And now using this lift, I can plug that into my Hochschild machinery and analyze algebraically the structure I obtain. Is there a uniqueness statement? There is. A uniqueness statements under certain hypotheses, uh, under certain connectivity hypotheses. But in general, this is not unique. Is it okay if I take five minutes or? No, take ten. Ten. <laughs> I can take ten. Let's see. 
So let me quickly review uh, this construction of Hochschild chains and co-chains. So my, my laser pointer died. But I guess that's fine. So the, the precise construction doesn't matter too much, but associated to any algebra, any differential graded algebra, we have this Hochschild co-chain <coughs> complex, which is a chain complex that computes the endomorphism algebra in the derived category of A by modules from A to itself, whatever that means. We'll, and that's a differential graded algebra when equipped with a product map known as the Hochschild cup product, has a precise formula. And we can also consider Hochschild chains, which this has a underlying um, graded vector space, this free algebra on a shifted copy of A, tensor A, with some differential. And the point is that this chain complex computes the derived tensor product of A with itself in the category of bimodules, of A bimodules. I'm considering A as an A bimodule. And um, this is equipped with a, a degree one operator, which encodes the cyclic symmetry of the construction. This is known as the cons operator. And what's surprising is that, well, I already hinted about this result using coalgebras. I'm taking a dual perspective of algebras. For a simply connected manifold M, the Hochschild co-chains with an appropriate shift compute the homology of the free loop space of the underlying manifold. And similarly, the Hochschild chains on any model for the manifold M computes the cohomology of the free loop space of M. There's a little detail with the degrees of these complexes. There's a lower star here. There's an upper star here. It means you have to grade one of these negatively, but we should not worry about this now. And there's a special map. AM is a Frobenius pi algebra, remember. There's a special map obtained by composing the coproduct and the product. Applying the coproduct first and then the product. This map, if AM is a Point that, grade, what is AM again? This is po it's a point grade duality model for the manifold. It's a Frobenius differential graded Frobenius by algebra. From the other theorem. Exactly, from the other theorem. Uh, computing the cohomology of the manifold such that the yeah. cohomology is the. Yeah. And this, this map is exactly multiplication by the Euler characteristic. This is a degree plus n map because the pro the coproduct in this case has degree plus n. We think of it as the dual to the intersection product or wedging with a thumb form. That's what it's modeling. And the product is a model for the wedge product of, of forms or the cup product of cohomology. So this map is multiplication by the Euler characteristic. That's a special map that can be defined for any Frobenius by algebra, in fact. And um, so I, I'll try to end here. Um, so note that these Hochschild complexes have a bigrading. You have a length of monomials, which I denoted by M here in the co-chain case and by n here in the chain case. And you also have a total degree. So p means degree p maps between these two graded vector spaces. And p here means degree p elements, total degree p elements. So we can take advantage of this extra grading that we have in these Hochschild complexes to describe string topology operations or to understand the structure of string topology. And the construction I will be proposing is the following. 
So <laughs> this looks a bit complicated, but let me explain it. On one side, we may consider Hochschild chains. So all of this, this, all of these are graded objects. There's a star, right? So you should consider these as columns. On the right hand side, we can consider Hochschild co-chains. So Hochschild co-chains, you think of as a model for the homology of the free loop space. Hochschild chains, you think of as a model for the cohomology of the free loop space. And you connect these two complexes using the order characteristic map to obtain an unbounded complex. Recall that on this side we have a cup product. You can, there's, you can, there's a, the Hochschild coachings have a differential graded algebra structure. Can you just put that map there and make a big complex? Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay, just put that chi map there. Chi map be, here. It might are, be zero, but that's okay. Yeah, this is, at degree zero, this is isomorphic to a copy of A, length one chains. Yeah, okay. And here as well, which you can think of as a model for constant loops in some way. So you connect them. So just make one big complex. Right. Well, you don't know if it's a complex yet. That's part of the statement. Wow. For any Frobenius by algebra A, the totalization of this big double complex, um, oh sorry, for any Frobenius by algebra A, this is a double complex. Or in other words, this is a complex, right? So it scores to zero here. D lower h and then chi right. equals zero. And then you apply dh, you zero. zero. Yeah, and same here. Chi followed by dh is zero. Okay. DH is zero and DH chi is and zero. And DH chi is zero. I see. So and that, that, follows, is yeah, that follows from the Frobenius compatibility in A, one of these first equations we started with today. And then the statement is the following. So let me end here and give an interpretation of this statement. The diagram above is a double complex. And I will denote the totalization by d star a. So this, this construction of joining two, joining um, chains and co-chains with additional structure is reminiscent from Tate cohomology for groups. That's why we call it tate hochschild complex. We use the Frobenius structure to connect these two complexes. Then we construct an algebra structure, which is not associative, but it's associative of two higher homotopies, which are part of the structure. That's what an A infinity means. And which is compatible with the natural pairing. That's what cyclic means. I can pair chains and co-chains. Well, that's like Frobenius. Exactly. That's like Frobenius. Extending the Hochschild cup product on this side, an algebraic model for the loop coproduct on this left hand side. This is the operation that required modding out by constant loops. But now, instead of modding out by constant loops, I have extended the differential, I modified the differential to get rid of this anomaly that you. Yeah. So you don't divide now. You don't divide. Good. You modify the differential. And the product that we obtain in this... This is not equivariant. Not equivariant. Okay. The product that we obtain in this total complex also extends the classical cap product defined for a Hochschild chain and a Hochschild co-chain. Because we also have mixed products. So. I will stop here, but... So this is the manifold uh, algebraic... What's that? This is the manifold uh, uh, algebraic... In some sense. ...with its duality yeah. and geometry. Okay. At the level of, of the freedom space. Well... Of the... 
critter's base is the idea behind it, but it's right. all made out of a manifold. Piece right. Of so you, right. you can interpret this as a type of Poincare duality for the free loop space. Right. Yeah. Coming from the Poincare duality of the manifold. Coming from the Poincare duality of the manifold. Exactly. And it combines these two major string topology operations, which I guess Natalie will tell us about more in her talk. So let me end here. I can say more at the break, but I have, I have a picture. <laughs> topological Hochschild homology and cohomology, and even a cake theory. Does uh, your picture fit in with that? Um, so those are spectra, as you know. Right. right. So how, I don't know, that's the short answer. How would you interpret uh, Poincare duality at the level of spectra? This, yeah. That's well, there is a whole machine for doing that. Mm -hmm. right? You know, so maybe, yes. I don't know about constructions in this way. Yeah. Um. <coughs> this feels unstable to me, a priori. Maybe what you're doing. Yeah, what I'm doing. So. Well, this picture I said, because of technical reasons, is also in the simply connected case. So um, the next step is to use the models in the non-simply connected case I was describing in the first part of my talk in string topology to describe this picture in the non-simply connected case. Yeah. Which, yeah, uses some sort of Calabi-Yau duality, as you know, but at, on the side of co-algebra. I can say more about that. Does this construct, the last construction, is it, um, given the smooth manifold, say, is this construction determined by that, up to some equivalence, or is there choices involved? We um, understand it there yeah. as choices. So, right? Yeah, so this, that's a good question. Of course, the, this construction that I described happens to be homotopy invariant. Mm -hmm. Homotopy. Okay. Yeah. But uh, as Florian Nayak, who's here, has observed, uh, in the non-simply connected case, we expect the, um, the analog construction to require additional structure that sees the manifold structure of the underlying space in the non-simply connected case. Maybe one more quick question and then the rest during the break. Any questions? I can count that as a question of zero time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's thank Manuel one more time.